An emotion is a motivational state, and it can be plotted on a three-dimensional axis. There is level of arousal. There is approach withdrawal, and there is reward punishment, which is the motivational aspect of emotion. And on that three-dimensional grid, all human emotion can be plotted. But the most important one I want to focus on right now is the motivational dimension. Because if emotions are motivations, and you can self-regulate your emotions using your frontal lobe, you can self-regulate your motivation. So that the frontolimbic circuit is the source of self-motivation. This is where you are able to motivate yourself in the absence of consequences. This is where you think about those goals, and in thinking about them, it actually motivates you. It actually creates a positive, motivational mood state. You want that goal, you want to attain it, and you will use that motivation to sustain action over time in the absence of consequences. Humans are the only species that can sustain behavior for more than seconds to a minute in the absence of a consequence. All other species are Skinnerian, stimulus response organisms, but not humans. Humans can build in a pause, and in that pause they can aim their behavior further ahead in time, and they can reach into the limbic system and motivate that behavior. This is the source of drive, persistence, willpower, stick to the ability to chart a course and to dog it to death. As Walt Disney said, the secret of all success is this ability to take an idea and to sustain action toward it in spite of all irrelevant activity going on around you. You know it as persistence and determination. Most adults would refer to this as willpower. And it is what many adults with ADHD who we have interviewed have said that they lack. The ability to engage in a self-disciplined, persistent course toward their goals. They have goals. They have ideas. They have wishes. They have dreams. There are things they hope to accomplish in life, and most of them will never be attained. Not because the ideas were not good ones. Not because the what and the when were impaired but because they can't fuel the fuel tank. This is like a great cruise missile with a brilliant computer system and a map of the enemy's terrain, and the fuel tank is empty. The missile sits on the launching pad. Brilliant as its plans may be, it cannot get off the pad. You need self-motivation for all future-directed behavior. And so now we know where the self-motivation deficits are coming from. The corollary of this deficit is that people with ADHD will always be dependent on the immediate consequences that surround them for how long they can sustain an action, for how long they can persist. They will be externally dependent on the fuel for their behavior. Others are internally dependent. They generate their own motivational states. So now you know why it is so hard to sustain action toward a goal, because part of the deficit is motivational. ADHD is MDD, Motivation Deficit Disorder, in part. That's the anterior cingulate. Why would I want to draw attention to this? For a couple of reasons. First of all, I want to tell you that there are two parts to this structure that have only recently been discovered in the past decade. George Bush has reviewed all of this literature. By the way, it is not that George Bush. Right? He's a neuroimager at Mass General Hospital. And he has shown that the anterior cingulate is not one, but two separate functional zones. The upper one in red, which I think should have been in blue, as you'll see in a moment, if color is to mean anything. But this upper zone is involved in helping you make decisions in social conflicts, where there are social consequences now and later for what you're about to do. Whenever you face decisions in which there, are, there is a competition, a conflict, between the events of the now and what's going to happen later if you act this way, the anterior cingulate helps to negotiate that conflict. It buys you time to think about it and then allows you to execute 
behavior that is in your long-term welfare, not just your short-term welfare. But the blue structure has now been identified as playing a role whenever there is emotional conflict. Whenever there is an emotion elicited by the moment, but the long-term implications of showing that emotion are detrimental to your well-being, this part of the anterior cingulate lights up. Because this is where the frontal lobe is going to suppress the emotional system. And it's going to do it through that zone. We can see that here. This is the opposite hemisphere. So we're looking at the frontal lobe here. We're looking at the anterior cingulate here. We're looking at the very rostral front part of that anterior cingulate here. And we know that this region of the brain projects back into a very old primitive system known as the amygdala and the limbic system at large. The limbic system is the emotional brain. Most species with a brain and spinal cord have this system because this is where emotion comes from, and especially aggression. That is largely an amygdala activity, though it does other things besides that. So what does all of this mean? Well, let us back up. Excuse me. We know that this part of the brain is smaller in people with ADHD. And as you will see on the following diagram, that midline structure does not activate in adults with ADHD, as it does in normal adults who face social or emotional conflicts. The anterior cingulate appears to do nothing. What is that going to do? It is going to leave you prone to not regulating your limbic system. You are going to be very emotionally impulsive. You will be characterized as having low frustration tolerance, impatience, quickness to anger, unable to tolerate waiting, showing your emotions more easily than others, and more raw, unmoderated emotion, hence the term impulsive emotion, and more generally, more easily excitable. Now, if all of that sounds like a mood disorder, it isn't. Mood disorders are where the limbic system is overexpressing abnormal levels of emotion, and individuals have trouble regulating it. That would be bipolar disorder, for instance, which is largely a limbic system disorder. In contrast, ADHD is not a mood disorder. It's a failure to regulate mood disorder. It's a self-regulation of emotion disorder. The emotions the individual is having are quite normal, but most people would have suppressed them, would have inhibited, moderated, self-calmed, self-soothed, and then brought those emotions in line with their longer-term welfare in that situation. That is what the person with ADHD cannot do as well. Inhibit, self-calm, self-soothe, contemplate, and moderate that emotion. So if you're an adult with ADHD, you may find yourself sitting in a business meeting where you have just been insulted. You are much more likely to leap across the table and throttle your supervisor. <laughs> and you will be fired. Everybody else felt as you felt, thought what you thought, and summarily suppressed it. In their mind, they throttle the supervisor. <laughs> but it is not released to be expressed through the spinal cord into real behavior and action. And now you understand the difference. The mood is the same. The expression of the mood is not. There is no stopping to self-regulate the emotional state. So we now know that emotional impulsiveness and dysregulation are just as much a part of adult ADHD as our inattention, poor working memory, poor time management, and impulsive decision making. And now you know why. It is the inability of this anterior cingulate to govern that limbic system so that emotions, once provoked, get expressed without the top-down management that other people would be doing using the frontal lobe to reach in, take hold, and fine-tune the limbic system so that it is more appropriate for social goals. <clears throat> ADHD is not an attention disorder. It's a blindness to the future. It is a myopia to the impending future events. You are nearsighted in time. 
which means that the child and adult with ADHD are going to wait until the future is imminent. And then they will try to deal with it. But as long as the future stays out there, I don't have to deal with that. The closer it gets, the more I'm going to organize toward it. But I can't really do much about it until it's the 11th hour. And then I will race around, try to slap things together in a hapdash manner to get it done. ADHD creates a nearsightedness to time so that the person with the disorder cannot organize to the delayed future, but only to the imminent future. And so everything in life becomes a crisis. But the crisis was avoidable, and no one has any patience with this because they see this as a moral failing. You could have chosen to get ready, but you didn't. It is phrased as a form of laziness. This layabout, ne'er-do-well, carefree, careless attitude that you could change if you wanted to, right? But we know it as the executive failure. It really is. This disorder precludes you from organizing across time. So you live in the moment. And you cannot organize very large, hierarchically sequenced behavior across time. It means that future-directed behavior is intentional behavior, which means ADD is actually IDD intention deficit disorder. I don't seem to be able to accomplish most of the things I intended to do. You can call that a short attention span, but I think intention deficit disorder captures it much better. Now the frontal lobes, the executive system is where you take what you know and you apply it in your daily life. It is not where you know something, it is where you use what you know. The back part of the brain acquires knowledge. The front, front part of the brain puts it in play. ADHD has separated these two like a meat cleaver. So it really doesn't matter what you know. You can't use it as effectively as other people can. ADHD is a performance disorder. You can't perform the things you know how to do. It is not a knowledge disorder. Most people with ADHD know about as much as anybody else from their neighborhood with their education in that school at that age. But they can't use it, not to anywhere near the degree of effectiveness of others. So people with ADHD know what to do, but they can't do what they know. One of the things we have known in neuropsychology is that if you wish to treat an executive disorder, a performance disorder, the only way to treat it is to change the point of performance. The point of performance is the place out there in life where you should be using this knowledge, and for some reason you can't seem to do it. So all treatment must be at the point of performance, and if it's not, it won't work. No amount of treatment done away from that place will solve that problem. Only changing that place will solve that problem. You have to restructure the environment to help them show what they know. So what does this mean? It means that teaching skills is a waste of time because they won't be used. Skills are knowledge, and these people already have most of the skills anyway. But even if you teach them new ones, the likelihood that they will get implemented is pretty slim. I can hand any adult a list of time management recommendations, and I can guarantee you that most of them will never get used. In fact, the paper will be lost on the way home because it will blow up <laughs> under the front seat of the car, and then you'll forget that it's there. Or if you do remember that it's there, you'll tape it to the refrigerator, but you won't look at it. And if you do, you'll say, you know, I really should be doing those things. These are really cool things. This is what I really need help with. And then you'll just go about behaving impulsively anyway, and you'll come back in and say, you know, Dr. Barkley, those were great ideas. Did you do them? Well, I'm working on it. Boy, I find that hard to do. You see what I'm talking about? This is not a knowledge disorder. It never was. It's a problem with using what you know. And no sheet of paper corrects for a performance disorder. This is the part of the brain that matures too early. People with ADHD have this part developing too quickly. This is the primary motor zone. This is where small, discrete behaviors are executed. Hence the restless, hyperactive, off-task, irrelevant motor movements often seen in the young child with ADHD. You've got a hypermature primary motor strip that is ungoverned by an immature frontal cortex, and that gives you your hyperactivity. But the hyperactivity will decline markedly with age, becoming internal in form, a subjective sense of restlessness, but not an outward hyperactivity. The adults that we have seen in our clinics and in our research projects do not climb on furniture. Spouses do not bring them in because they're sliding downstairs in suitcases. 
We don't see them building ramps in the snow over roadways so that they can jump their sleds across the road. One of my patients tried to do that. Right? <laughs> but the adult with ADHD commonly reports an inner restlessness, both of thought and activity, where they describe themselves as needing to be busy to be engaged in multiple activities. The term multitasking has been used with for this inappropriately. Multitasking refers to people who can successfully do multiple <laughs> things at a time. You may have multiple things going on, but they're not getting done. I think the biggest problem we have had as a group in convincing the general public about the seriousness of our children's disorder versus autism or schizophrenia or the other disorders is the very name itself is trivial. ADHD. Pfft, go to Starbucks. Good God. Have some caffeine. We got more serious fish to fry here in psychiatry than the fact that you just can't pay attention, right? Part of the reason that our disorder, that the name of this disorder, is so often pilloried in the media is because I think we misnamed it. This is a developmental disorder of self-regulation not of attention. To refer to ADHD as inattention is to refer to autism as hand flapping and speaking funny. They are the most obvious symptoms of a failure to develop the ability to relate to others as special objects, as humans. And that is what autism really is underneath. The rest of it is just the most superficial set of symptoms. So I would want my family to understand the profundity of these deficits because inattention hardly captures what is going wrong in development. I would want parents to understand something that the vast majority of the lay population does not understand. Self-control is not learned. It is not the result of your upbringing and how good your parents were. This is one of the most profound insights from our research on ADHD. ADHD, as we will see, is largely a neurogenetic disorder. But then let's pursue the implication. If that is true and ADHD is a self-regulation disorder, then self-control is largely neurogenetic in origin. That has a philosophically profound conclusion. The vast majority of variation in the people sitting in this room and their ability to manage their behavior is not from how they were raised. It is a part of who they are. It is a part of their neurogenetic gifts. And that is very stunning indeed, that our capacity for regulating ourselves is a neurobiological trait, not some socially learned phenomena that you just happen to pick up from your parents. My child got thrown out of school yesterday for some misbehavior. Would you please go to school and get him reinstated? He should not be held accountable for these consequences, right? Because after all, didn't you just say it's a neurogenetic disorder? So let me help you understand something about what I've just said. ADHD does not cause a problem with consequences. The problem is with time. It was the delay to the consequence that disabled you which means that I'm going to do the opposite of what this mother is asking. Increase accountability, not decrease it. Increase the frequency, immediacy, the salience, and the timing of consequences. People with ADHD need more accountability, not no accountability. In fact, this view of ADHD as an executive disorder would tell you that if you argue for no accountability, you will make this disorder worse, not better. Because the problem is the delay and all natural consequences of any importance are delayed. What does that mean? We are going to have to use behavioral treatments, the BMOD programs, the tokens, the charts, the cards, the Smurf stickers, whatever. What is their purpose? Their purpose is not to teach. That is a misnomer, if you will. Their purpose is to sprinkle artificial consequences into these delays in the natural environment in order to increase your accountability. So they're not teaching anything. They are making up for the accountability deficit disorder. BMOD does not teach anything to ADHD children, really. What it does is improve the motivation to show what you know. By making you more accountable, more often, around you, you have less ADHD. By excusing you from the consequences, you'll be more ADHD. 
So I want you to understand something. There are two reasons why we would tell you as a family to do behavior modification. One is instructional. This is why we teach families of autistic and mentally retarded children behavior modification, to teach their children things they don't know. But the second purpose you would do BMOD for has nothing to do with instruction. It's motivational, to make up for the motivation deficit disorder that this disorder produces. And so if you do BMOD for its motivational value, you can't stop it. Because if you pull it, you've pulled the motivation. If you do BMOD for its instructional purpose, you can pull it. Because once they've acquired the skill, they'll use the skill and you don't have to worry about it anymore. Now, do you see a, a contrast here? Most parents and nearly all teachers I deal with believe that BMOD is for instructional value. That's why we do it for ADHD, which is why whenever you go into a school and you try to teach a teacher to set up a token system, the first question out of his mouth is, how long do I have to do this? When will he internalize the program? And my answer is, never. <laughs> as long as he's in your class, you will have to arrange artificial consequences to replace the delayed ones. And if you don't do that, he will not work for you. So, I want you to think about token systems and star charts and all behavior modification as being equivalent to a ramp that comes into this building. That ramp is there to make people who are physically disabled less motorically impaired. They can get into the building in their wheelchairs or whatever other devices they're using. But would you ever say to such a person, after 30 days of entering this building successfully using the ramp, <laughs> you know, <laughs> You know the punchline, right? Can I take the ramp away? Have they internalized the ramp? Well, of course not. The ramp was never for teaching, right? The ramp is a prosthesis. A prosthesis is an artificial means of reducing the disabling consequences of your disorder. It is not to train you up into anything. No amount of using a ramp is going to take the ramp away. And no amount of BMOD is going to take the BMOD away. These individuals will always need more frequent consequences around them than will other people in order to perform at the same level. There is also another popular phrase in some of the adult ADHD trade books. Adults with ADHD are good at hyperfocusing. This too is mythology. Hyperfocusing is actually perseveration. You are unable to interrupt what you're doing when you should have shifted to doing something else. It is like the child who continues to play the video game long after they should have been getting dressed for school and out to the bus. You want to call that hyperfocusing? That's fine, but that is a classic sign of a frontal lobe injury, and it is perseverative responding. You should have stopped what you're doing, and you didn't. There were other, more important goals to have been accomplished, and you ignored them. This is no gift. It is, in fact, a symptom of this disorder. Hyperfocusing goes with autism. Perseveration goes with ADHD. Now, we also find when we meet with our adults with ADHD that this diagnosis and this history of impairments usually brings with it a mild grief response. Sometimes it's not so mild, by the way. Sometimes the anger and the grieving and the depression are quite extreme and require separate counseling sessions in their own right. We have had adults with ADHD become extraordinarily angry about how could earlier professionals have missed this diagnosis and the regrets they have about the failures that are now irreparable. The marriage is lost, the college degree never attained, the friendships that were lost, the accidents that they had, maybe the injuries. You can't make up for that. Even though you make a diagnosed at 35 or 40 years of age, there's 40 years there of irreparable harms that have mounted up. So it's no surprise that some of our adults are angry or depressed about not having been treated earlier when it might have made a difference in changing their life course. So we will spend some time with these adults, speaking with them about these feelings and helping them unearth them and cope with them, but moving them on to the end stage of a grief reaction, which is acceptance. So that's where we want you because you won't engage treatment if you haven't aggrieved and accepted your disorder. It explains so much more than the current view of ADHD explains. 
As I will show you, ADHD children are 11 times more likely to develop oppositional defiant disorder within two years of the onset of their ADHD. Why? What do those disorders have to do with each other? Now they're treated as simply comorbidity. Oh well, they go together, but we're not sure. But if you put emotion back into ADHD, you see the connection right into ODD, because everybody with ADHD is automatically subclinically ODD at the get-go. It's only going to take one more symptom to cross the diagnostic threshold. In other words, ADHD causes ODD. That is an important thing to understand because the ODD, while it does have some social influences over it, half of ODD is the inability to manage frustration, impatience, and anger. And that will set you up for the second component of ODD, which is interaction conflict defiance, arguing. But the first four symptoms of the eight in ODD are mood, anger, temper, hostility, easily annoyed, irritability. And that is part of ADHD. So we need DSM-5 and we need families to both understand that emotion goes with this disorder. It is not a separate comorbidity in some cases. And now we know why when we treat ADHD, particularly with the medications that we use, we get nearly as much reduction in ODD as we get in ADHD. And when we don't, it is because of the social conflict component, which is learned. And we will have to unlearn that little piece. But the mood component is the ADHD component. Now, by returning emotion into ADHD, it also helps families to understand some of the other life course risks. 50 to 70 percent of ADHD children are utterly rejected by close friendships by second grade. It is, in fact, one of the more devastating consequences of this disorder, is this inability to make and keep close, sustained friendships with other children. And it is heartbreaking for parents to see this happening that their child is not as liked as other children, that the sleepovers, the going to the movies, and the other social events in which other children celebrate their peer relationships are shut off for this child. Why is it there? The single best predictor of peer rejection is that symptom, the emotional impulsiveness. Friends forgive you your distractibility, your forgetfulness, your working memory problems, and even your restlessness. They will not forgive your anger, your hostility, the quickness with which you emote to other people, because it is offensive. It is socially costly. So now we can begin to understand the numerous social problems that ADHD children are prone to, because it arises from this aspect of the inhibitory deficit. There are other things that it explains. I could do a whole hour and a half, as I did a month ago in Toronto, on the importance of emotion in ADHD. I won't go there. But suffice to say that it explains the road rage during driving, the job dismissals, which are not the result of inattentiveness, but of being too quick to anger, too quick to express raw emotion in the workplace, of which employers are not tolerant, especially if it occurs with a customer. And it also explains to us the marital difficulties and the parenting difficulties these children may be prone to because the single best predictor of marital problems in the adult with ADHD is not distractibility. It is emotion. So we can begin to paint a better picture of understanding ADHD and its life course risks by understanding the nature of the inhibitory problem and that it includes emotion as part of it. And that's just slide one. I've got 85 slides. <laughs> Do you see why I'm concerned? 